California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda with May Robeson in I Met My Love Again. Lux presents Hollywood. I want to say thank you to the thousands and thousands of women who buy Lux toilet soap regularly. This kind of loyalty is what makes our program possible. And now, before going on, I want to mention that tonight we are making a special offer to the ladies. We'll send them, almost as a gift, a new, smartly designed double compact. We'll tell you later how you can get this beautiful compact, and we suggest that you have pencil and paper ready. Our stars tonight are Joan Bennett, Henry Fonda, May Robeson, Margaret Hamilton, and Louise Platt in I Met My Love Again. As special guest, Jimmy Starr, Hollywood's famous news columnist. Louis Silvers conducts our music. And now, here is the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Throughout the land, May 30th is a day of tribute and remembrance. We of the Lux Radio Theater join in paying our respects to the memory of those Americans, men from the North and men from the South, who from Lexington to the Argonne fought and died that this country might have the peace and progress we now gratefully enjoy. Tonight, we bring you the story of a great love which triumphed only after a loss of many years. And starring as the two who lose and find their love again are Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda. Three hundred years ago... While the ancestors of Joan Bennett were wandering around England and Scotland as strolling players, both my forebears and those of Henry Fonda decided to see America first. They did their wandering across the Atlantic and wound up in a town called New Amsterdam, which the newcomers of the past 274 years have been calling New York. Old Anthony DeMille, arriving from Holland, settled down to raising crops and a family in lower Manhattan, while Henry's folks went north to a spot near Albany. The Fonders had hailed from the Republic of Genoa, and their name was taken from a valley in the Apennine Mountains. Richard Bennett gave his distinguished name to three daughters, Constance, Barbara, and Joan. Striking out on her own, Joan moved to Hollywood, where the fact that she was a Bennett meant nothing. Glad to get an occasional job as an extra, Joan lingered in Hollywood until her father sent for her to fill a part in a Broadway play. This time, Hollywood went to Joan, brought her back as a star, and brings her to you next in the new Paramount film, The Texans. Unnoticed until his performance on the stage in A Farmer Takes a Wife, Henry Fonda, like Miss Bennett, was lifted to Hollywood fame almost overnight. Currently starring in Jezebel, he's next seen opposite Madeline Carroll in Walter Wanger's film, The Blockade. Tonight, both he and Miss Bennett resume the same roles which brought them high praise in the screen version of I Met My Love Again also produced by Mr. Wanger. Miss Bennett plays Julie Weir. Mr. Fonda is Ives Towner. And I'm delighted to welcome back in the part of Aunt William, that beloved character actress distinguished for more than 50 years on stage and screen, Miss May Robeson. Margaret Hamilton plays Mrs. Towner, and Louise Platt resumes her original role as Brenda Lane. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda with May Robeson in I Met My Love Again. time in New England, and nowhere in the year 1928 did Spring write her name with more wanton generosity than in the happy little college town of Lynnborough, Vermont. Through a meadow not far from the college, a path winds leisurely. Down the path come two figures, a boy and a girl. Ives Towner is 19, Julie Weir is 17. Julie's devoted gaze rests upon Ives, who's reading intently from a book quite unaware of the running creek ahead of them. Yes, the book is poetry. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thou art beautiful, O my love. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, 
terrible as an army with banners. Me, Alex? You, Julie. And one of King Solomon's wives. Julie. Yes, Alex. Julia. Gosh, gosh, it's swell out, isn't it? You know, I... Ives! Gosh, I almost didn't see the creep. Oh, Ives, you're not hurt. No. No, just a little wet, I guess. Julie, let's sit down here. Yes, Ives. Are you sure you're all right? If anything happens sure, to you, Sure, I... I'm all right. Just a little water. Oh, Ives. Julie, you kissed me. Gosh, do you mean you... Yes. Are you sure you mean it? It wasn't just an impulse, Ives. I love you, I love you, and I couldn't stand it any longer. I thought you'd never kiss me. There, I had to say it quickly or never. Only I can't believe it. I'm... I mean, it's more than I ever expected. Julie. Oh, Ives, I do mean it. Let's go to Upton and get married. Today, shall we? Shall we? You really would? Of course I would. Come on. I dare us to get married. I haven't any money, Julie. Nobody outside of Lindborough has ever even heard of me. What's that got to do with it, you well, silly? It's got everything to do with it, Julie. Everything. I want to be big enough for you. And, Julie, if you'll wait for me, I will be. As soon as I graduate from college, they're going to put me on the faculty. Just, just an instructor at first... Oh, Julie, maybe I'm just young and foolish, but I want our love to be something different. Something rich, complete. Something holy. Julie, will you wait for that? Yes, I'll wait, Art. Only, please don't make me wait any longer if you're ever going to kiss me. Oh, Julie. with you. Why didn't you answer me? Oh, I'm sorry, Aunt William. I, I was just thinking. Julie, Carol's downstairs. Is Ives going to drive you into Upton? No. His mother wants him to stay and string some silly lights on their Christmas tree. Well, why don't you wait? No, I don't want him to go anyway. We're going to get him a Christmas present. Oh, I see. Well, you mustn't blame Ives for not going with you and you don't want him to go yourself. Oh, I'm being unreasonable, I know it. It's just that I never get to see Ives anymore. All year he's at college, and we never get a chance to be alone or have any fun or go dancing. Julie, Julie, you know, you've got to be patient. Oh, I know, Aunt William, but I'm tired of being patient. I want to... Oh, I don't know what I want. I'm being horrible, aren't I? Yes, you certainly are. Forgive me, Aunt William. Julie, are you coming? In a minute, Carol. Now, go on, go on, go ahead. And make sure you get back early. Don't forget, the party starts at eight. <laughs> Ives, now what do you want? Bothering Agatha and me. I'm glad you come, Ives. And take Aunt William out of the kitchen. Cooking donuts is my business. I'm the maid, ain't I? Thank you, Agatha. But I prefer minding your business to your minding mine. Aunt William. Well, what is it? I was just wondering where Julie can be. Ives Towner, haven't you got sense to see it storming out? She's been held up somewhere. I haven't seen a blizzard like this since the year the barn roof stove in. Besides... If you've been Julie Weir's fiancée as long as I've been around, <laughs> you'd know that she's never yet got home on time for her own party and never will. Just the same. Uh, I wish she'd come. <laughs> uh, William? Oh, hello, Carol. Having a good time? Oh, my. You don't look it. What's the matter, sis? Well, look, I, I wasn't going to tell you, but now I'm scared. It's, it's about Julie. Well, what... what? What about Julie? Well, Julie and I had a race this afternoon from Upton, and we hired sleighs and horses from Livermore Stables, and yes. Julie bet me six pairs of silk stockings oh. that she could beat me home. I took the new road, and she took the old Milford road, and I won! Fine sister you are. <laughs> well, Julie's lost and in this blizzard. Supposing she comes... Well, now, stop, stop that nonsense, Carol. Ives, where are you going? I'm going out and find Julie. I'm afraid I'm lost. Well, 
Come in. Thanks. Oh. Well, what lovely stroke of fortune brings you here out of the night? Oh, I don't know exactly, but it was pretty awful. I was racing another girl home from Upton. She took one road and I took the other. I, I guess it was pretty silly in the stall. Oh, sounds lovely, lovely. Well, here, uh, let's get rid of that coat, shall we? Well, I... Thanks. But... I'll take care of your horse in just a minute. You'd like something hot to drink, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Coffee, tea, uh, maybe a little brandy. By your drink, I shall know you. Tea. <laughs> okay, tea. There's one good thing about a cabin like this. We've got everything handy. Say, you're not that bobbed hair bandit I've been reading about, are you? No. Well, if you won't be afraid of me, then I won't be afraid of you. Please, I- I'd like to use your telephone. Who do you want to call? For my Aunt William. But I haven't a telephone. You may have to stay here for uh, quite a while. <laughs> you look scared. Please don't be. Where I come from, they call me Gentle Michael. Where's that? New York. I'm just up here to do some writing. Oh, you mean people really publish what you write? The wrong people do. You see, I've got to make a living, so I write trash to keep alive. But somewhere in that desk is what I really write. The greatest novel ever written by any American, dead or alive. <laughs> look. I'm terribly glad you came in and awfully glad to meet you. I'm Michael Shaw. I'm Julie Wick. Well, happy Christmas, Julie Wick. Uh, don't you think all this gallantry deserves something a little fancy? Like a... Well, I've got a little... Tea? <laughs> Here's tea. Lemon? Please. Yeah, sit right where you are. This is my party. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, dear. Julie. I'm supposed to be giving a party, too, right now at home... Gee, I wonder what they're saying about me. Hey, Aunt Williams, that's for you. Oh, maybe if I, it's maybe they found Julie. If you turn off that awful music, Hubert, I'll find out. Hello? Yes, Ives? Well, where are you now? No. Nobody's seen her. Yes. And it's nearly 11. No. No, I won't. I won't worry. Goodbye, Ives. Uh, William. No. No, they haven't found her yet. Ives. Ives is going to call me at 12. You know, I... I, I think you'd all better go home now. Oh, gosh, Aunt William. What'll Mother... Oh, your mother will have a million fits about Ives as usual. Well, tell her... Tell her I'll call her just as soon as I hear that. You know, Julie, almost every night in New York there's a new play opening and parties by the publishers. Oh, it's lovely. But when do you write? That's it. That's why I came here to Vermont. You know, it's lovely fun talking with you, Julie. You're like a lovely new sheet of paper to write on. Not plain white paper or yellow, but something enchanting and new and inviting. Like Lake Geneva in the evening at 7 o'clock. Michael, what time is it? What difference does it make? Julie, you can't go. Look, it hasn't let up a bit. Why, you may be here for months. <laughs> you think I'm crazy, don't you? I know you are. You're lovely. You use that word an awful lot. You think that means I'm delicate? Well, I'm not. I've been in jail. What? Mm Mm-hmm. In Paris. Somebody gave a party. Parties were always my downfall anyhow. (laughs) That's why I like them so much. Parties will be my downfall, too, if they ever find out about this one. I'm going back to Paris soon. Have uh, you ever been there? No. But it's my idea of heaven. I wish I were in Paris this minute. Mind if I was alone? I don't know. Tell me about you. In love with someone? Yes, engaged. Hmm. What's the lucky gent's name? Ives Towner. He's an instructor at the college. Never heard of him. Do you know about love? (laughs) What do you mean? That love is a lovely phony unless you know what it's all about. How do you know you're in love? How do you know anything? Maybe I don't. Listen, Julie. This is one night in 20,000 nights. Don't you feel that? 
Talk to me. Tell me things you've never told anyone else. Not even yourself. Go on, Joy. Tell me what you dream about, and I'll tell you what you've missed. No. No, you don't have to. I know. You don't know a thing about me. You silly kid. You're like all the rest. You like to talk of adventure and all the good, brave things of life. But you're scared to death of them. I'm not afraid. You take a cocktail now and then. You kiss your professor goodnight. You read the new books. But down in your heart, you're still a dusty Victorian. Afraid of today, of 1928. Afraid to be alive. I am alive. Listen, Julie. Shut your eyes. Why? Because I'm going to kiss you. No. Shut your eyes. You won't be so afraid. I don't want to shut my eyes. Uh, William, come in. Good morning. Good morning, Carol. Where's Ives? Who is it, Carol? Come here, Ives. Well, she's safe. I just heard from her. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Towner. What is it? Ives hasn't slept a wink. Oh, come in. Oh, come in. You'll have some lunch with us. Oh, no, no. No, thank you. No, thank you, Mrs. And William, where is she? Yeah. I just got a telegram. Ives. Julie is married. Ives, she is William. What? She married a man named Michael Shaw. He's a fake. But I guess she doesn't know that. They're on their way to New York. She told me to tell you that she's writing you. Well, that's all I know, Ives. Thank you, Aunt William. And now, if your mother and Carol will excuse me, I'm going home. Mary. Mary! Oh, Ives, you fool, don't look like that. It's not the end of the world, you know. Ives, dear, you have everything to look forward to. Your father left you a wonderful heritage, and you can be everything he was, the greatest naturalist in America. You have all his work on the protozoa to finish, and possibly a professorship. <gasps> Just think what is before you. Just think of it. Besides, Julie was never the sort to settle down to your kind of life. You need someone who's patient and interested in science. Oh, Mother, that's got nothing to do with it. The only trouble with Ives is that he's stubborn. Stubborn? Yes, stubborn. Well, you just won't be young. Why, you haven't the faintest glimmer what love is. You think it's sacred and sweet and all that rot. But you're the only person left who does. I'm going out. Ives, your coat, your galoshes, Ives. Don't worry, Mother, I'll be back. I always come back, don't I? Maybe that's what's wrong with me. I you catch your we death. We were going to work this afternoon on those specimen drawings, weren't we? We can't miss that, can we? Julie's married. Julie's gone. But we can't forget our work, Mother. Oh, no. Julie's gone, but the protozoa goes on forever. <laughs> Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda will return in a moment for Act Two of I Met My Love Again. We want to take advantage of this short intermission to explain to you in a brief playlet the offer of a compact which we promised the ladies at the beginning of tonight's performance. Well, I hate to say good night, Helen. It's been a grand party, and thanks so much for having us. Oh, I'm so glad you could come. It's been grand having you all here. Well, we'll have to hurry. I'm afraid our folks, our men folks, are getting impatient waiting. Oh, dear. I can't find my compact. I must have left it at home. Can one of you girl, uh, girls lend me yours? Well, here's mine. We use the same shade of powder, don't we? Thanks. Oh, Helen, what a beautiful vanity. Oh, it is nice, isn't it? I love it because of the lovely golden-colored bands across that gleaming black enamel. Oh, Let me see. You must have cost a fortune. And black and gold are colors that will go with anything. And it's such a lovely shape and so dainty. Horseshoe pattern for luck, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And see, it's a double compact with room for loose powder. And it comes with a neutral rouge ready to use, and you can get refills for the rouge at any time so easily. The mirror's the full size of the compact, too. I bet you girls can't guess what I paid for it. One dollar? One fifty? Oh, I'd say two dollars. I paid exactly twenty-five cents. Oh, well, I don't believe it. Well, if you hush, I'll tell you how you can all get one. You can simply wrap up twenty-five cents in coin in three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and enclose your name and address. Send it to Lux Toilet Soap, box number one, New York City, 
and you promptly get back one of these compacts. Oh, gosh, Helen, thanks a lot. I'm going to go right down to the store tomorrow morning and get three cakes of Lux toilet soap and mail the wrappers in with my quarter so as not to get left out of this. Grace is a smart girl, and you will realize just how smart she is when you go to your store tomorrow. For if your store is like most of the stores throughout the country, there'll be special prices on Lux toilet soap. So you'll kill two birds with one stone. You'll save money on the finest soap a woman ever used and at the same time be able to get this beautiful and serviceable compact made by Van Style at the amazingly low figure of 25 cents. Compacts like it are on sale in lots of stores for one dollar. Remember, simply send three Lux toilet soap wrappers with 25 cents in coin folded up in the wrappers. Don't send stamps. And enclose a slip of paper with your name and address printed clearly on it. Then, mail to Lux Toilet Soap, box number one, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. And now, Mr. DeMille. Joan Bennett, Henry Fonda, and Mae Robeson continue in I Met My Love Again. Two years have passed since Julie Ware married Michael Shaw and went with him to Paris. But in two years, few things change in Lindborough, Vermont. Although Ives is now assistant professor Towner, assistant professor of advanced biology. In Paris, things have gone none too well for Michael and Julie. Somehow, the gay wastrel Michael has never quite come round to finishing the great American novel. Something's always interfering. Then one day, something interfered for good and all. Three days later, the news reaches Lindborough. My husband said he saw it in the New York paper. Michael Shaw. He was shot, killed. I suppose that means Julie will be coming back to Lindborough with her baby. Yes, killed in some brawl. Left her in debt, too, I hear. Just what she deserves for jilting Ives Towner. Julie wouldn't dare show her face here again. What's she going to do now? She and that child of hers. And poor Aunt William. After all she did for that Julie Weir. Aunt William is sick. Wouldn't be surprised if this killed her. Oh, come in. Oh, hello, Ives. Hello, Aunt William. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling fine. I wouldn't be in bed with that old fool, Dr. Monroe. Sit down. Sit down, Ives. Aunt William, what's she going to do? I don't know, Ives. Did you, did you send the cable? No, no, it's too slow. I telephoned. She won't come back. The only thing that's coming back is the money I sent her. She said she'd found a job. Designing dresses. I see. And the little girl? Joan? Oh, oh yes, she's getting a nurse to look after her. Oh, Ives, why must she be so stubborn? I guess she's got too much of me in her. That's why I know she'll come back someday. I told you she's coming back after all these years. I heard it from Agatha. Coming back with her child. She must be almost ten. Thought she was designing dresses. Well, I guess that fell through right enough. Mommy, is that Lindbergh way over there? No, darling, that's only fog. We won't see Lindbergh for nearly a whole week yet. Mommy, did Daddy come from Lindbergh? No, darling. But Daddy was the most wonderful man in the world, wasn't he? Yes, darling. Dad was the bravest man in the world, wasn't he? Yes, darling. Mommy, will Aunt William like me? Oh, I'm sure she will. She's the finest lady in the whole world. No, Mommy, you are. Mommy, what's it like in Number of Vermont? It's very quiet and peaceful. Not at all like Paris, darling. There are trees and green grass and cows and little clean white houses. And there's a college in Lindbergh where people study. They teach all kinds of things there. They teach history and literature and languages and biology. Mommy, what's biology? Biology, darling. Biology is a science. It's the science. Biology is the science of life for living organisms, a branch of which is polymorphism. Is there anyone in this class who remembers that word? No? Well, polymorphism is a term designating the existence of several forms of individuals in a species. Excuse me, Professor Talbot. Yes, Miss Lane. How do you spell polymorphism? If you look in your notebook in just five seconds, your neighbor, Mr. Budge Williams, will have written it down for you. Won't you, Mr. Williams? (laughs) We all know, Mr. Williams, that superb quarterback. (laughs) Quiet. The Society of the Ants is divided into several classes. There's the female queen. Look, Dottie, he's 
looking the right queen at Brenda Lee. demands at all times to be the focus of the entire community. <laughs> and there's the functional male whose purpose is to impress the queen with a glorified impression of himself. Now he's looking at Budge. What is the purpose of this society? What is the sense in it? Professor Talma. Miss Brenda Lane thinks she knows. Put your hand down, Miss Lane. You don't know any more than I do. We can only guess. Stab in the dark. Excuse me, Professor Towner. Yes, Miss Taylor? Telephone. Evidently important. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be right back. And the class is not dismissed. you not to telephone me while I have a class. Eyes, now don't be cross. It's important. I knew you'd want to be warned right away. I just heard. Heard what? She's coming back today. Julie Weir is coming back. Now, Ives, I'm sorry, but I thought you'd rather hear it from me. And, well, I was afraid you might do something silly, like going to the station and setting everybody talking again. Have I ever done anything silly in my life? Goodbye, Mother. Now, where were we? You were stabbing in the dark, Professor Towner. Yes. Stabbing in the dark. Class is dismissed for the day. (laughs) Professor Towner. Well? I thought if you're going home, I could drive you. Thanks. I have my car. Besides, I'm driving over toward the station. Oh. Professor Towner. I know how annoyed you must be with this class, including myself. But you shouldn't have to be in a position where you could be annoyed. What in the world are you talking about, young woman? Well, you know my father. He's ridiculously rich, but he's a nice man anyway. Is he? Well, the point is, you mustn't think me impudent, but, well... You see, he knows what a splendid reputation you have as a scientist. Miss Lane, there's a train coming in, and I... Yes, but I think he'd like to make it easier for you to do your scientific work without wasting your time on a lot of kids. Why should he do that? Because I'd like it. You would? Why? It's a long story, Professor Talmer. It can't be that long. Did you ever read Eloise in Our Blood? I mean, you mustn't think I'm crazy, but it's true. It's very much the same story. That's foolish. It's not foolish. I admire you terribly, and, well, forgive me, but it's, it's hard to be clear and simple about a thing like that. A thing like what? If you're still talking about your father and me, please accept my thanks for your offer, but I don't need it. Furthermore, I'm not Abelard, and you're not Eloise. Miss Lane, I'm a very bad audience for your play acting. Miss Lane. You deserve that. I hope I didn't keep you from your train. No. And thank you, Miss Lane. I've changed my mind. I'm not going that way after all. So many years. Aunt William. Oh, darling, it's so good to see you. Julie. Julie. (laughs) Darling, it was such fun hearing your steps on those old stairs, Julie. Saucy as ever, too. You're dead wrong, Aunt William. There wasn't anything saucy about my steps. You in bed. Agatha told me you haven't been well for years. I did this to you. Oh, no, no, no. Nonsense, nonsense, Julie. Oh, darling... Oh, I'm so glad you're back. For for good, I hope. No, only for a month. I think I've got a job in New York designing. Let me see about that. And have you got 1928 out of your blood, huh? I think so. I've had ten years of it, but I still make hideous mistakes. I guess anyone who starts off in life marrying a man she doesn't love never gets straight again. Julie, Julie, did you, did you ever love I? Yes. I loved him so much I was too happy. Mm. Darling, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes something makes you so happy you don't realize what it is. And you think it's everything else in the world except the thing it really is. And you never know until you've lost it. Julie, he's old already. Beaten. All the things he could have been are gone. He's lost. Unless... Unless you find him again. No, I I couldn't again, Aunt William. 
I'm not young either. I've thrown my youth in a Paris ash can. I can't bring it back. I don't want it to come back. It's just gone. Oh, don't cry, darling. It's not so horrible. We all have to grow up sometime. Excuse me. Joan, dear. Joanie. Yes, Mummy. Come upstairs, Joan. Aunt William would like to see you. She's knock-kneed and spindly, Aunt William, and has too many teeth in her mouth, but I like her. Hello, Aunt William. Knock-kneed, yes, and spindly, yes, but, you know, I think I like her, too. Do you like mine? Of course I do. Your daddy's eyes, <laughs> Mummy says. You've got lots of wrinkles, haven't you, Aunt William? Joan, <coughs> what a way to talk. Never mind, never mind, Julie. The tradition of dealing out the honest truth has to be carried on by someone in this family. Isn't that so, Joan? Yes, Aunt William. Aunt William. Yes, Joe. Aunt William, why have you got a mustache? God bless my... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Mother, isn't Hubert the silliest thing? (laughs) Well, what else could I tell the guy? Boy, he shut up like a clam. (laughs) Uh, Was I right, Ives, or was I right? Eyes, Hubert speaking to you. Yeah, yeah, me, uh, your own brother-in-law, remember? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, you were right, Hubert. Ives, why don't you break down and go to the prom Friday night? Oh, no, yeah. thanks. But well, why not? Now, Carol, keep quiet. What was your lecture about today, son? Hmm, uh, polymorphism. Polly, who is him? I say, uh, uh, did you knock him in the aisles, kid? I knocked him cold. <laughs> oh, by the way, Ives, I see in the paper that a friend of ours has returned from Paris. I don't even remember what Julie Weir looks like. Ives, where are you going? Just down to the creek, Mother. If I can find that old net of mine, I'll see if I can pick up some specimens. Excuse me. Ives, be careful. Yes, Mother, I'll be careful. I knew it. He's still in love with me. This isn't a river, darling. It's just a nice little creek. When I was a little girl like you, I used to play here. And this path goes right by it, just like a sidewalk. Yes, darling. Would you like to wade in it? Oh, Mommy, yes. Did you used to wade in it? Many, many times. Look, Mommy, there's a man. He has a net like to catch butterflies with. That's a fishing net, darling. If you're very quiet, maybe he'll let us watch him. I'll be quiet, Mommy. He's awful skinny, isn't he? Joan, you mustn't... What's the matter, Mommy? Who is that man? Do you know him? Yes, Joan. Give me a hand. Hello, Ives. Julie. It's fine to see you. Uh, I'm, I've been catching whitefish for study. Oh, Aunt William's been telling me what good things you've been doing with your work. How's your mother, Ives, and Carol? She's married, I hear. Yes. They're fine, Julie. Thanks. Ives, uh, this is Joan. How do you do, Miss Shaw? How do you do? Well, goodbye, Julie. Ives. Yes? This isn't nice of us. I know, Julie, but what do you want us to do? Nothing. Just be a little civilized? Would that be asking too much? I don't know, Julie. Oh, come now, Ives. After all, we must have liked something about each other once. There must be plenty of things for us to talk and laugh about. Yes, plenty of things. Ives, you look like a statue. What are you staring at? Oh, all the things a statue stares at. Windy, cold streets, strangers walking by. Julie, what's the use of our talking? It's no good. Goodbye, Julie. Goodbye, Ives. Mommy, I don't like him. Who is he, Mommy? Oh, just someone I used to know. John Bennett, Henry Fonda, and Mae Robeson will be back with us in a few moments for the third act of our play, I Met My Love Again. In the meantime, Mr. DeMille has something interesting for you. But first, may I remind the ladies in our audience not to miss the opportunity of obtaining one of the beautiful compacts mentioned earlier on this program. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before beginning the third act of I Met My Love Again, starring Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda with Mae Robeson, we bring you another personality from backstage Hollywood, 
as we place this brief intimation in the capable hands of Jimmy Starr. Jimmy's ability to streamline the English language and his keen sense of news rank him among the most widely read of Hollywood observers. His column of screen gossip in the Los Angeles Herald Express appears in newspapers throughout the country. And now, Mr. Starr, come on and twinkle. Okay. I'm going to turn the wheels and reels of Hollywood into reverse and go through an imaginary photograph album of yesterday in Hollywood. Who were the stars on this 30th day of May five years ago, ten years ago, 15 years ago? What were they doing? Those are your questions, Jimmy. You answer them. Five years ago, May 30th, Clara Bow promised to stage a movie comeback, but never got around to it. Catherine Hepburn was doing a garbo by hiding out from newspaper reporters. Ginger Rogers had a small part in Gold Diggers of 1933. Marie Dressler and Wally Berry were filming Tugboat Annie. Ten years ago, May 30th, Eddie Lowe had just made a hit in Dress to Kill, the first of the gangster movies. Thomas Meehan was starring in The Racket. And the pet bear of Dolores Del Rio, which she used to take for a stroll down Hollywood Boulevard, got a jail sentence for taking a nip at her butler's leg. Fifteen years ago, May 30th, Jack Pickford and his bride, Mary Ma Marilyn Miller, were visiting his sister Mary. Charlie Chaplin was directing Edna Proviance and the Woman from Paris. Lon Chaney had just finished The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Strongheart, the first dog star, was filming The Phantom Pack. And Mabel Norman was starring in The Extra Girl for Max Sennett. But marriages, mergers, and time have changed the Hollywood picture, Jimmy. Yes, the former Billy Dove lives in town, goes shopping on the boulevard in slacks, and gets a big thrill when the fans recognize her. Viola Dana is married to the famous long-drive golfer, Jimmy Thompson. And Vilma Banky is Mrs. Rod LaRock. Colleen Moore is also married, while her one-time leading man, Charles Ray, devotes his time to writing novels and short stories. And you know, Mr. DeMille, there's one Hollywood star to whom the years bring only greater fame, and that's your product, Lux Toilet Soap. Lux Soap has been m making this town happier and prettier for many years, and you say nine out of ten stars use it. Well, I'm still trying to find the one who doesn't. Hardly a day goes by when I don't encounter Lux Soap, either at the studios, the dressing rooms, or in the stars' homes. Judging from what they say about it, Lux is going to enjoy his great popularity just as long as stars want fine complexions. And that's going to be always. Thank you for that observation, Jimmy. Now what's the latest gossip along Hollywood Boulevard? Well, here we go. Two items, each with four feet on the ground. Bow Wow Scoop. Joan Crawford is now building a three-room doghouse. Jumbo, her 230-pound Great Dane pooch, is to have this extra-large residence because the servants were going to turn in their notices. It seems that Jumbo used to sleep on the back porch, but his snoring kept the servants awake. Jumbo now is the only dog in Hollywood with a soundproof house. <laughs> Bow Wow Scoop number two. Herbert Marshall has just escaped losing the sight of his right eye. Romping with a friend's dog on his front lawn, the chow snapped at him, re removing a portion of the star's right cheek. If upon it... If, upon examination, the dog shows signs of rabies, Marshall will immediately take the famed Pasteur treatment. And speaking of treatment, I think it's about time I took a powder. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. DeVille. Thank you. Thanks for the stardust, Jimmy. <laughs> Our curtain rises on the third act of I Met My Love Again, starring Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda with Mae Robeson. A week has passed since Julie returned to Lynnborough, and although she and Ives continue to be the town's favorite topic of discussion, they haven't seen each other since their meeting at the creek. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. At the edge of the college campus, Brenda Lane is waiting for Ives beside his car. Well, Miss Lane. I thought perhaps you wouldn't mind driving me home. My car's broken down. Honestly. You expect me to believe that? Please, Professor Turner. What have I done to make you so rude to me? I'm sorry. Get in. I'm sorry about what I did, slapping your face the other day. But however it sounds to you, I mean it. I love you. I think you're a nice girl, Miss Lane. But you dramatize. You build up a lot of colorful lies in your own mind and then try to sell them to me as art. They're too young, too silly, too incredible. Now, suppose I turn around and take you right back to your car. I'm sure you'll suddenly find it in perfect running condition. Hives, please listen to me just this once. Okay. It happened to 
happened a year ago. I saw you coming across the campus, and I thought you were a student then. You look so young. I was in the library. I know, in the library, reading about Eloise and Abelard, about the young love of a girl for a sourpuss professor, weren't you? <laughs> yes, I was. But you see, when I saw you walking then, a wonderful thing came to me. I knew that something new and rich was happening to me, something almost holy. Wait a minute. Something what? You mustn't laugh at me. Something almost holy. Holy. That's word for word out of my mouth ten years ago. <laughs> I'm not insulting you now, Brenda. I'm insulting myself. One laugh for every one of those last ten years. <laughs> Look, Brenda, you must never make yourself unhappy over me. Ten years from now, you laugh too when you remember riding in my car. If I'd only managed to laugh ten years ago, come on, snap out of it. Forget your sad young love and be happy now, because that's what I'm going to do. All right, but... But what? Kiss me, I... Sure, why not? Someday you'll love me, I... No, I'll never be in love with you. I'm not in love with anyone and never will be. You're very pretty, aren't you? And you don't mind that I'll never love you, do you? I don't know. I think I do mind, but... Kiss me again, Ives. And I won't say anything more about it. Now. If you'd stop listening to those cheap, small-town gossipers, Julie Weir... And listen to me for a moment. It's not just gossip, Aunt William. What they're saying about me is true. I guess when I came back here, maybe in the back of my mind was a silly hope that I could be young again, that, that even Ives and I might like each other again. Aunt William, I'm going back to New York tomorrow. Oh, Julie, you're an impulsive fool. No, Aunt William. I'm just being a wise, sane, unexciting matron. I'm just being the person I suddenly realize I am. Mommy, am I going to New York with you? Uh, Joni, where did you come from? Oh, Mommy, it's so nice here. Oh, Julie, Julie, be reasonable. Honest, Mommy, we can have a lot of fun here without ever seeing that nasty tall man. We're going to New York, darling, and that's all we're going to say about it. Hello? Agatha? Who's that on the telephone? It's not for you. It's for Miss Julie. It's Ives Towner. Ives? Hello, Ives. Hi. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, too, I... I... I wasn't very nice about it. The prom? You're going to the prom? Oh, yes, I... Oh, I, I'd love it. Yes, at nine Tuesday. I mean, Friday. Yes, good night, I... And thank you. Aunt William, Aunt William. Now, let me see, let me see. I think there's a train leaving for New York. Oh, what's and... the last thing on earth you'd expect me to be doing of a Friday night? I'm going to a dance with Ives Towner. Glory, glory, it's 1928 again. <laughs> Well, Julie, here we are. Yes, I... Sort of remarkable. It's going to rain tonight. Hadn't we better get into the dance? That's <laughs> so funny. Won't you let me in on it? Of course. You asked me the other day to be civilized, didn't you? Well, Julie, I just learned to be, and I'm sort of proud of it. I... Did you ask me out to show me you could be civilized? I've just found my sense of humor. You don't mind. No, I, I don't mind. Come on, let's dance. Swell. Remember the time I made a fool of myself at school when old Marshall found that poem I wrote you? Gosh, I can still hear him reading it to the class. My only love, your music down the midnight street. Yes, yes. Oh, Julie, I was such a dope. No wonder you left me. No wonder you fell in love with Michael Shaw. Oh, I don't want to do it. Let's get out of here. I mean, on the porch. Sure. Besides, there's the punch bowl over there by the door. Want some? No, thanks. <laughs> porch, a spring night, and us. <laughs> Let it rain. Who cares? Michael Shaw. It's all right, Julie. I'm not jealous. I could have killed him once. 
But now I'd shake his hand. I know why you loved him, because he was gay and slippery and wild. Well, I'm that too now, Julie. Laugh with me. <laughs> Please, I've just someone. Hello, I. Oh, hello. I came here looking for you. Very considerate, Brenda. Allow me. Mrs. Shaw, one of my cleverest students, Miss Lane. Mrs. Shaw. I came here looking for you, too, Mrs. Shaw. I thought you might like a glass of punch. <gasps> Brenda, you crazy little fool. Julie! Where are you going, Julie? Julie, stop running, Julie! Well, what are you standing here for? Why don't you run after her? Thank you, Brenda. I will. I've run after her for ten years. It's Julie. Oh, let me alone, Ives, please. Is that rain on your face or tears? Oh, Julie, I'm sorry, Julie. Oh, it's your laugh, Ives. I can't stand your laugh. It's such an easy way out, Julie. Oh, I know I'm different from what you thought I'd be, but I'm still Julie Weir. And I guess I'm still Ives Towner, but what good is that going to do us? None. I still love you. Julie, darling. Don't cry, darling. We're starting now, this instant, you and I. We're wet enough to do anything. Come on, let's run for it. Julie, I... What did you say? I said I love you! Aunt William, it's us. We're engaged. We're going to be married. We're engaged to be married tonight. Miss Julie, you're dripping water all over Aunt William's counterpane. Oh, be quiet. It's lovely water. Well... Now I can get out of bed. William, don't you dare. You get out of my way. We're driving to Upton now, as soon as I change. Mommy, Mommy, I woke up. Oh, Joan, darling, we're not going to New York. Mommy, don't, don't. Don't what, darling? May the dreadful torment here. Joan, why, you hardly know Mr. Towner. What have you got against him, darling, except that he's tall? <laughs> I see what she means. Joan, dear, from now on, every time you see me, I'll squat like this. Don't you dare talk nice to me. I hate you. I hate Joan, you. Joan, are you aware what a nasty little terror you're being? You get that little stubborn morsel of humanity over here to me. I want to talk to her. Joni, what's the matter with you? My dad was a brave, lovely man. Not a tall, skinny thing like that. My father could look at the set out of you. I'll take care of her. Come along, Joni, dear. I still love my dad. I hate you. I hate you. Probably the neighbors complaining. I'll go down. Stay here, Agatha. I'll answer it. All right, I'm coming. Well, hello, Mother. Hello, Carol. Hubert, what's the matter? I've heard all about it, every detail. How dare you insult that nice, scholarly girl, Brenda Lane. Who said I insulted her? She did. She came right to me. I never saw anyone so stricken in my life. And then to come back to her, after all these years, like a weak little puppy. Oh, she's here, too. This happens to be her house, Mother. Come here, Julie. Good evening. Carol, maybe you can tell me why Mother's here. Well, It's you, I... Julie Weir. You nearly ruined his life once. You'll not do it again. And you, Hubert, what do you feel about it? Well, uh, well, I sort of feel that it's none of my affairs. That's white of you, Hubert, mighty white. But, uh, well, uh, I can't help but feeling that if it, it means so much to Mother Towner, and, well, uh, you'd be surprised how it even affects my tile business. Of course. Julie and I are going to be married tonight. Ready, darling? Ready to be married or ready to be hanged? I couldn't tell by your tone. I'm sorry, darling, but let's go. I thought we were all here. I guess I was wrong. Well, who's next? Professor Towner? Come in, Budge. You know everyone. I have something important to tell you. Maybe we should be alone. Oh, no, Budge. Everybody must know my business. Tell it here. It's about Brenda. I took her home after she saw your mother. Professor Towner? That poor girl tried to hang herself on account of you. Ives. Budge, she's all right, though. Yes, for the moment. I drove her here. She's waiting outside. She'll be all right for a moment more, won't she? Yes, I think so. I don't believe it. I don't believe she tried to kill herself. She knows I never loved her. She's known it all along. I didn't love Michael Shaw either. But look what he did to my life. And yours. Ives, I'd like to see you alone. Maybe we'd better go, Mother. Oh, there's no need of that. We can go in the other room. Julie... The thunder and lightning's over now. I suppose the sky is like it is most of the time. Oh, don't you see, Ives? It was only the excitement of lightning that could make us think we could do it. We can't go back, Ives. Go away. 
Go away quickly. I won't go. I won't give you up. You were willing to marry me until this happened. We can't quit now, Julie. No, I... It would be the same sort of selfish thing I've done all my life. At least we've had tonight. There aren't many people in this world who could have had tonight, my darling. Julie, be selfish once with me. But, Ives, don't you see? Goodbye, Ives. Say, where are you going, Julie? Don't let her. She's getting in my car. Brenda's in there. What do you mean? Get out of this car. What are you trying to do? Shut up. I... But... You can't get away with this. See, Ives is coming after me. I'm glad you have such a nice, fast car, Brenda. Now, for the first time tonight, I'm the one who's going to do the talking. Do you love Ives Towner? Of course I love him. I love him with all my heart and soul. He and I were going to be married tonight. It was very important to us. Do you think you had the right to prevent it? I don't know anything about rights. I only know I can't live without him. Are you sure? I never was sure of anything. I can't live without him. Well, neither can I. What are you going to do? What did you mean? What do you think I mean, Brenda? You're not afraid to die. You tried it once tonight. Maybe you'll have better luck with my company. No. No, Sloa. Please, Sloa. I don't want to die. Well, don't kill us. Well, don't kill me. At the moment, we're doing nearly 90 miles an hour. See, Brenda? Nearly 90 miles on a nice wet road. Sloa. I didn't try to kill myself. I, I only wanted to make eyes think I did it to get him back. Please, Mr. Shaw. I want to live. You want to live without him? Yes, yes. You were lying before? Yes. I'm sorry, Brenda, but I had to do it for all of us. Stop crying. Yes, Mrs. Shaw. Come on, climb out. If we wait by the road, I think ours will be along very shortly. Five o'clock, Aunt William. Is it? In the morning. Ain't you going to bed at all? Oh, don't worry about me, Agatha. Where's Miss Julie? She ain't in her room. Oh, and don't worry about her either. Oh, go to bed. Go to bed, Agatha. Hmm, that's where I was till Joan woke me. Seems she's changed her mind about like an Ives Towner. Yes, we had a long talk, Joan and I. <laughs> Guess you could talk a body into most anything. <laughs> I'm always willing to try. <laughs> oh, go to bed. Go to bed, Agatha. Can I get you a cup of tea or something? No, no. I think I'll sit here and watch the sun come up. Watch the sun come up? Well, if that ain't silly. Home, darling. Home at last. Mr. and Mrs. Ives Towner. Let's go upstairs and tell Aunt William. She's asleep. You're crazy, not Aunt William. She never sleeps. Betcha. Betcha. Shh, quiet. Oh, Julie, we don't need thunder and lightning now. No, darling. Don't put on the light. You'll wake her. If she's asleep. I told you. I can't believe it. After waiting all this time. Ten years. Good night, Aunt William. God bless you. And please, God, let me grow old like her. Come on, darling. <laughs> well... The sun's going to look mighty good coming up this morning. <laughs> so ends our play, I Met My Love Again. Tonight's stars who meet us now for in a curtain call are busy these days at Paramount Studio. But if you could catch them between scenes, you'd find Miss Bennett designing furniture for her new home. While Henry Fonda is looking, <clears throat> looking for a farm on which to raise turkeys, continuing Grandpa Fonda's activities of some, some 300 years back. What's wrong with raising turkeys, sir? Well, nothing, Henry. Nothing. A turkey's a very noble bird. Back in 1782, it came pretty close to becoming the national emblem, with men like Benjamin Franklin rooting for the turkey over the American eagle. And what happened? Well, they, they compromised by putting the eagle on the coat of arms and the turkey on the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> now that you've pointed the conversation towards Henry's ancestors, what can you say about his contemporary, good old Anthony DeMille? Well, if you, if you look on the New York police blotter for 1689, Joan, 
you'll encounter a little item which relates that Anthony DeMille was arrested for striking the sheriff. Nice people. Even 300 years ago, DeMille was making a spectacle. <laughs> was he hanged? No. Oh. No, in 1691, two years later, he was uh, elected sheriff. What did he leave you, Mr. DeMille? His badge? <laughs> no. No, but I have his original will. It seems Anthony had two sons. To his favorite, he left two barrels of mackerel. What did the favorite son do for a living? Train seals? What did the black sheep of the family get? A can of sardines? <laughs> no. No, Grandpa didn't like the other boy. So he gave him what he considered the least of his possessions. The will reads, That parcel of ground lying between Beaver Street and the river. Today, that takes in about half of lower New York City. All of which undoubtedly gave rise to the ejaculation so current in the 17th century. Holy mackerel. <laughs> what about your grandpa, Joan? You mean old Beelzebub Bennett, the whirling dervish of Edinburgh? I don't know, do I? Probably, because he left an old piece of parchment on which he wrote in Sanskrit. If you want to get anywhere in Hollywood, keep your complexion on the upbeat by using Lux toilet soap. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? No, it isn't the truth. Not about old Beelzebub Bennett. But it's very true that Lux soap is about the best care a girl can give her complexion. I know I use it const I know because I use it constantly, and I'm really grateful to the sponsors of this program for giving us such a splendid product. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, and good night to you all. Good night, C B. Good night, Joan. Good night, Henry. In a moment, Mr. DeMille will return to tell you of the news about next week's performance. But first, may I remind you, ladies in the audience, that every one of you may have one of these truly beautiful double compacts. The top is designed in a stunning horseshoe pattern, finished in gleaming black enamel with bands in gold effect. The bottom is richly tooled in a harmonizing design and contains a full compact size clear vision mirror with space for loose powder and with neutral shade rouge ready for use. Why, this very modern compact will remind you of a piece of fine old antique jewelry that is so very lovely. Send only your three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers with 25 cents in coin folded into them and a slip of paper with your name and address printed on it to Lux Toilet Soap, Box Number 1, New York City, and you will receive this truly beautiful compact promptly. Compacts very similar, but not our exclusive design, are sold in many shops for a dollar. Of course, there is no advertising whatsoever on the compact in any way. So remember... Send 25 cents in coin wrapped in three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers together with a slip of paper bearing your name and address printed clearly to Lux Toilet Soap, Box Number 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. And now, Mr. DeMille. One of the highlights of Broadway's legitimate theater this season was the revival of the best-known play by one of the greatest dramatists of all time, A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. Produced three times on the screen, this memorable drama, which never grows old, comes to you next Monday night. The story of a young wife whose courage and sacrifice save the life of her husband, a husband who places his pride above her love. As the star of a doll's house, we bring you the talented and glamorous Joan Crawford. Starred with Miss Crawford is Basil Rathbone, and featured in our cast are Sam Jaffe and Nedda Harrigan. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in a doll's house with Sam Jaffe and Nedda Harrigan. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Henry Fonda stars soon in the Paramount film Spawn of the North. May Robeson is in the new Warner Brothers film Sister Act. Louise Platt appeared through courtesy of Walter Wanger and will also be seen in Spawn of the North. Margaret Hamilton's new RKO film is Mother Carey's Chickens. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for Josette. Soft lights and sweet music heard during tonight's performance was from Face the Music. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.